Hi, I'm Mike, and welcome to another episode of Mike's Collection. Uh, this is going to be one of my kind of general episodes. I'm not talking about any uh, set of toys or reviewing any one thing in particular. I uh, just kind of want to talk about what's going on in the my nerdy world this past week. Um, so just uh, until I work out the kinks of this, I'll just follow the format that I did in the last uh, general episode. So I started off talking about news, and uh, there really isn't much as far as nerd news that interested me that I have to talk about uh, here this week. Um, there was nothing really new as far as toys announced, uh, nothing really in the world of movies. Um, so yeah, there was a, a, a poster that leaked for the new Star Wars movie, uh, Episode Nine. So that revealed some characters that we haven't seen before. Um, so that probably gives me an idea of some toys I'll be buying in the next year. Um, but still no information with that. Uh, it's hard to know how important these characters are to the movie. Or uh, The bottom of the poster shows a bunch of stormtroopers um, in slightly new helmets and stuff. And so that could be a cool figure. It's a little hard to tell if they're uh, if they're in white or possibly red because um, they kind of look at first glance like they might be red stormtroopers, but it also might just be the uh, kind of the glare from Kylo Ren's lightsaber. So I don't know. Anyway, looks like a pretty cool poster uh, in the same vein as all the other Star Wars posters before it, just kind of a montage of images. Um, and for toys. Yeah, this me. I'm recording this right now. It's March 31st, and today is the cutoff for pre-orders from Super Seven to get their Masters of the Universe movie collection. So yeah, if you by the time you're watching this, which I'll probably post it today, but uh, it might be too late. So if you haven't got on board with that already, uh, yeah, you might be forced to buy them from Big Bad Toy Store or something, where there's going to be a bit of a markup, or uh, go to eBay or something. But uh, if you have the opportunity, if I get this up posted quick enough and it, you actually didn't know and this is a reminder for you, um, make sure you get on to Super 7's website and pre-order those uh, Masters of the Universe movie figures uh, before the end of the day. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's really it. Um, so I guess we'll just move right into our, our regular segments. So yeah, here we go. So my first reoccurring segment is just me telling you what uh, new toys I got this week. And this week has been uh, kind of slow, which it's okay. It, I need to have slow weeks every once in a while um, because, yeah, I am not rich. And uh, I've had a lot of toys come in the last uh, few weeks. So it's, it's a good sign that things are slowing down. And I am still expecting to get a bunch more stuff. Um, I've got the uh, Kingpin Build-A-Figure uh, Marvel Legends on pre-order right now. So I will probably have them, I would expect, within the next week or two. Um, there's also the uh, newest Avengers Marvel Legends for the new movie. Uh, I know people are starting to receive those. I've seen a lot of people online. They've acquired them. I haven't seen them anywhere here yet. Um, but I imagine they'll start showing up at Walmarts um, pretty soon. So, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of Marvel Legends coming. Uh, otherwise, there's nothing else I'm expecting uh, in the immediate future. So, this week, um, first thing I got was just a new pop. So, I got the Slinky Dog from Toy Story. And uh, I love the Toy Story movies. Uh, but I, I won't buy all these characters... This is one of the things, I bought Buzz Lightyear Pop not too long ago, and I kind of figured that Buzz Lightyear will represent my love of Toy Story. I'm not going to buy, you know, Wheezy and Bo Peep and all these other characters that they're doing. But I saw a Slinky Dog the other day, and I got him partly because I knew, like, for one, he's adorable, I like him. But I have a little wiener dog myself. If you've watched my past videos, you've probably uh, met Casey. Uh, I'll throw a little, I'll throw a picture of Casey in here so you can know what I'm talking about. Um, but I knew that my uh, fiance Vanessa would think this is super cute too because it, it reminds her of Casey. So I picked up Slinky this week. And yeah, it's, it's cute. Um, otherwise, um, the other things I picked up and have to show you, I actually bought last weekend and I recorded 
just a quick little review of those figures. So I will, uh, I'll cut to that. I'll show you the little video I filmed of my new stuff, and then we'll be back here to talk movies. So the other day I was in Giant Robot Comics, which is a comic book store over in Dartmouth, and they had a sale on their action figures, which was buy one, get the second one for half off. And this is one of the figures I bought. So this is Godzilla. And this is specifically based off of his look from Godzilla vs. King Kong. So, uh, there's a nice look at him in the packaging. And it's got a nice book style packaging that opens up there with Velcro. So you can open him up and you might want to keep this packaging as he stores away nicely in there. Unfortunately, I don't hold on to too much of the packaging these days, even if it is nice, just because I don't have room for it. I tend to keep uh, the blister cards from the backs of G.I. Joes and whatnot, but boxes like this, I just don't have room for it. So yeah, looks pretty cool. So I haven't opened this guy up yet, so let's uh, pop him open and take a look. So here is Godzilla out of the package. Uh, now before I talk about the figure, I will just mention the background that was behind him in the package. Uh, you get a nicer look at it once I... Once I've got it all opened up here, and it's a, like a nice shot of Mount Fuji or something there. And I might actually hold on to this, as maybe this will be a good background for some of my, my Instagram photos or whatever. So anyway, yeah, that's a nice little shot. So on to Godzilla. So my initial thought is he looks pretty great. A little bit of fuzz there. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, he looks kind of kind of stupid, but that's the way the old Godzilla looked when it was just a guy in a rubber suit. Um, you know, the outfits range from one movie to the next and how how believable it was as a, as a walking giant lizard creature. But uh, this is uh, looks very true to how he appeared in the movies. So, yeah, I like it a lot. The issue I have with this figure as I have with most of these Godzilla figures. NECA's been making a bunch of them, and maybe I should get on board and start buying them. But uh, I just found them too small. This guy's about six inches. Here, his tail, let me snap that on there. Okay, and here he is with his tail. That was a real, real son of a bitch to get in there. <laughs> I had to stop filming for about three minutes while I wrestled with that thing. But anyway, there's his tail now. So it's got a couple of points of articulation. Not at every single seam, but like there's one, two, three, four points, and at the very base. So basically five points of articulation on the tail. And he's articulated on the arms at the, so the shoulders are ball joints, and at the elbow, at the wrist, and his fingers, but it looks a bit too maybe. Uh, yeah, fingers have a little bit of articulation there. Uh, he's articulated kind of mid-torso. He's got a couple of joints on the neck. So there, there. So his head's got lots of movement. The jaw is articulated. Uh, the feet, knees, and thighs. So yeah, lots of posability. Which is nice, because like, uh, as I was saying earlier, I find these, these figures are sometimes too small. I want my Godzilla figures to be big. I don't want them to be the, the same size as, you know, like here's a five inch figure. And it just seems too silly to display this Godzilla next to any of my other figures when he's that small. So, like here's another Godzilla figure I have, which obviously the scale is still way off compared to this guy, but at least he looks, you know, he's big and he looks scary. And I like my Godzilla toys to be like closer to that size, you know, like 12 inches and bigger. However, with this figure here, it's mostly a solid hunk of rubber. He doesn't move a whole lot. He's got a, a little joint at the neck and one on the arm and one on each leg. Um, so I guess it's a bit of a trade off. You get this smaller one, but he does have a lot more of articulation, so I guess I just have to buy smaller little figures to display next to him so he looks 
bigger. But overall, yeah, this is a pretty, pretty cool find. And I'm glad I nabbed them when I did because I went in to uh, Giant Robot a couple of days earlier and they had like four or five of these things on the shelf. And I was thinking of picking one up. And then uh, the owner told me that they had a sale coming up on the weekend. So I should maybe wait. So I came back on the weekend and only one of them was left. And shortly after I grabbed it, somebody else was like, oh man, I was going to get that. So yeah, I almost missed out on it entirely. And I'm glad I didn't because yeah, it is a cool looking figure. And uh, hopefully they make a movie accurate King Kong to go next to him. Unfortunately, NECA makes all kinds of versions of Godzilla. And lots of toy companies make lots of versions of Godzilla. But not too many seem to make his, his enemies. And I'd really like a collection of all of them. Now I did recently get this King Kong figure. And these guys are pretty accurate scale wise. So, and this King Kong looks a lot better than the ratty King Kong that appeared in the movie King Kong vs. Godzilla. But still, I would kind of like one of those goofy old King Kongs. But yeah, these guys will look nice displayed next to each other on the shelf. And last thing I should mention is for an accessory other than his tail, he also came with some atomic breath. So let's hope that's easier to attach. And there's a hole in the back of his throat there. So yeah, there you go. It's a little weird looking, but you get the idea. And yeah, that attached much easier than the tail. So yeah, that's Godzilla. So another toy I picked up at Giant Robot Sale was this Transformer. Who I'm not really that familiar with. Uh, his name is Claw Jaw, which seems like kind of an odd name for a squid transformer. I would think maybe something more along the lines of his his beak or his tentacles, but Claw Jaw is the name they gave him this guy apparently. And uh, this was just a figure that uh, Giant Robot was selling loose. I've mentioned to you before how that comic shop is great for just having cabinets full of loose uh, toys, a ton of transformers. And they're at pretty reasonable prices. And I've seen this guy before, and I thought he was cool just because squids happen to be one of my favorite types of animals. But I am kind of a strict G1 collector when it comes to Transformers, so I passed on him a couple of times. But I saw they had a version in there again in the cabinet the other day, so I thought, well, what the heck. So I get this guy. So he didn't come with any transforming instructions, so I'm not 100% sure that this is right. It looks a little wonky, so it's probably not 100% right. But this is his squid mode. And he's got this weird little thing on the back. And if you press down on it, he's a uh, little beak claws there. So that's kind of cool, I guess. All right, so let's uh, transform him as best as I can. Like I said, I don't have the, the instructions, but he seems pretty basic. Um, yeah, maybe I'll mess around with him for a second. I'll come back to you. So yeah, I guess this is claw jaw in robot mode. Uh, as best as I can tell from images online. And like I said, there wasn't uh, that many moving parts, so it wasn't that hard to kind of guess my way through anyway. Um, yeah, so the little claw device still works in this mode. So his breasts can grab at you, I guess. Anyway, so yeah, this guy's kind of neat. And when they turn into animals, I'm always a little torn about if I display him as a, uh, as a robot, which is usually my default, because I don't really care about the vehicle modes all that much. But when they turn into dinosaurs and squids, um, it's kind of tempting to keep them in their beast mode. So I'm not sure what I'll do with Clawjaw, but uh, yeah, I like him in both in both modes. So yeah, kind of a weird, neat little addition to my Transformers collection. Now, this is another Transformer I picked up at the Giant Robot Comics sale. And whenever they get trade-ins, they post images on their Facebook page and they say like, here's our new trade-ins this week. And oftentimes I'll see something cool and I'll contact them and I'll be like, hey, can you put that figure aside? And they're like, oh, it's already gone. Anyway, they posted this picture um, the day before the sale. And he was kind of in the background of a shot of a whole bunch of Transformers. So I couldn't get a great look at him. And I wasn't sure what he was. And I thought, well, I'm not going to bother contacting them. But if he's there tomorrow when I go to get that uh, the Godzilla figure I was hunting for, I was like, maybe I'll check that guy out. And so I went and I asked uh, Daryl, who's the owner of the shop, if he still had that translucent seeker figure. Uh, and he told me that, yes, he did. 
And this is actually a version of Starscream, and it is the ghost of Starscream, and it is from the Armada Transformers line. So I'm sure some of you out there already know that, but uh, I'm not very well versed in any other of the Transformers lore outside of Generation 1. I didn't watch Armada or Energon or any of that stuff. But uh, this looks like a G1 Transformer. I think it's pretty, pretty accurate, uh, maybe not color-wise, but design-wise it's pretty accurate to what Starscream normally looks like. Um, and I was almost tempted not to get them once they told me it was Starscream, just because I'm like, well, I already have a better version of Starscream. I don't really need multiple versions of all these characters. But at the same time, I really like the Seekers, and the Seekers are all of those Transformer jets that all kind of look the same. They were, they were the same toy, just repainted in different colors, but in the cartoons and the comic books, they all have their own personalities. And uh, for a long time, I, was, I would stick pretty loyally to the like six Seeker Jets that were in the original series. But uh, every now and again, they would repaint it into a new color and release a seventh or an eighth Seeker. And I usually skipped those toys. I didn't pay much attention to them. But over the last few years... I've kind of embraced the alternate color Seekers and I've kind of been building a bit of an army of them. And so when I saw this translucent guy on the Facebook page, I thought, well, this must be a Seeker I'm not familiar with. It turns out it's Starscream, but he looks different enough from Starscream that I can display him on my shelf as a, a unique character. Oops. And I had seen online that I think in Japan when they released this figure, they actually named it Night Scream or something like that. So... Not that I actually play with any of these toys, but I like to have a bit of a story in my head rather than just have 20 different Starscreams. I can put him on there and say, well, that's not a duplicate Starscream. That is Night Scream. He is a unique character as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, he looks pretty cool. I'm not going to bother transforming him, but uh, he turns into a jet, obviously. And yeah, and he came with these couple of accessories. Uh, a gun and a sword. I think they attach to one another. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how, but yeah, they're pretty large. And it's cool that he had them. A lot of these secondhand toys I get don't have their accessories still with them, so that was a bonus. All right, so that is the Ghost of Starscream, or Night Scream. And this is the last Transformer I bought at Giant Robot Comics sale the other day. So this is Primus. So Primus transforms into the Transformers home planet of Cybertron. And here he is. So you can see he's a pretty big box. Let me spin that around a little bit. So that's what he will look like once I eventually get him open. Um, so there's what he looks like as Cybertron. He's kind of opened up there. Um, they also say he's got like a battle station mode, which I guess is what this is. But well, that just looks kind of silly. Now the planet mode is kind of cool. That's kind of what Cybertron looked like in the comics and the cartoons. Kind of had this hollow look. And it had a lot of cities. A lot of the cities have become popular in the Transformers comics and stuff. And apparently when you transform this guy, which I'm not going to do for this video. But he's actually got little, um, like these are supposed to be like little cities uh, and stuff. So that's pretty neat that he's got these little Transformer cities built right onto him. Another thing that I'm told is cool about this figure is that he turns into an actual full sphere. And then he's got these little legs that can hold it up so you can display him nice and easily without him having him roll off your shelf. Because um, I already have the Unicron figure, which is the better known transforming planet in the Transformers mythology. Um, but I have never transformed him into a planet. He has dis just been displayed as a robot mode for years. Um, but yeah, when I bought this one, uh, Daryl was telling me about how Unicron is kind of flat on the bottom. He's not an actual an orb. So I guess that's kind of cool that he transformed into a more believable planet. So yeah, let's take a look at Primus. Now, quickly, before I open up Primus, I just wanted to quickly let you know, if you're not that familiar with him, um, depending on which Transformers storyline you follow, like the old cartoon or the more modern comic books or whatever, um, Primus has been introduced in different ways. 
But in this, this here is a reprint of the classic Transformer comic books from uh, Marvel. So this is kind of the original storyline. And it was in issue 60, which is included in this collected edition, where uh, writer Simon Furman introduced the idea that in the center of Cybertron was Primus. And that's when we first learned that the planet, the metal planet of Cybertron, was actually this giant being. So that's where that comes from. And he hasn't always stayed that way in uh, later iterations of Transformers. Um, but yeah, that's where it came from. And that's the version I like to think of for Primus. So here is Primus out of the box. So you can see some of those details I talked about, like these here. Uh, I guess are maybe parts of those cities that I was speaking about that are found on his planet's surface. Uh, the head design is kind of cool. It's a little different from what we saw in the comic book, but similar enough. Um, let me see here. He's got uh, all his fingers are articulated there. Now, I literally just pulled this thing out of the box. I haven't messed around with it at all. So I can't really start showing you all of its features or anything because I really don't know what they are. He came with this thing. This is his only accessory. Um, from what I read on the box, you need this key to plug into him to, to transform certain elements of him. I don't know. That's different. Um, again, this was kind of part of the, uh, like if you look at the box again, it says Transformer Cybertron Robots in Disguise Trilogy. So that's probably the reason why I didn't pay attention to this whenever it was first released, because um, this is an older toy, um, probably from the mid-2000s. It's because I didn't really pay any attention to anything from that, what would be the Cybertron trilogy, which was Robots in Disguise, Energon, and Armada. So I don't know if the key thing was something that was popular in those lines, but I'm not familiar with it. So he just looks kind of like a mess from the back. But there you can definitely see some of the details on his planet mode. I'm a little worried to walk away from him for a wide shot because I don't want to feel this top over on me. But uh, yeah, he's looking pretty cool. And I might do a video where I review this guy in detail at a later date. So that's not what these videos are really about. I don't want to cover these things in depth. I just kind of want to show you what I got new. So yeah, if you think this guy's cool and you want a more detailed video about him, uh, let me know in the comments below and then maybe we'll revisit him. But uh, again, just for size-wise, uh, I'll grab something close. So here he is next to a... Whoop! <laughs> and he almost toppled over him. Here he is next to a six inch action figure. So he is smaller than Unicron and he's even smaller than say Metroplex up there, which is a little weird for scale because Metroplex is just a city, whereas this guy is supposed to be a whole planet. But uh, you can forgive that stuff. There's no way they could make a planet sized transformer to scale with everybody else. So, uh, yeah, I think we're lucky to get this guy at all. And, yeah, this is a pretty reasonable, manageable size to play with. So, yeah, turned out pretty cool. That is Primus. All right, so that's my newest purchases. Um, and now let's move on to our next regular segment, and it is called... Flick Chat. Yeah, so this is Flick Chat. Um, I haven't seen much in the way of movies this week. I went to one. I went and saw Us uh, on this past Tuesday. And I won't spoil anything for you, so if you haven't seen it, it's okay to continue watching. Um, but if you really want to go in a complete clean slate and you don't want to hear anything about it, then maybe you should skip ahead or turn it off, because I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, I won't waste your time with a review, because there's a million videos out there with reviews of the movie and lots of uh, blogs and whatever else. But I'll just give you my two cents. Uh, I thought it was okay. I didn't love it as much as uh, a lot of other people seem to. Uh, like, I liked Get Out. You know, I thought Get Out was pretty good. Um, 
And I'm glad to see that uh, Peel is getting all this attention. He does seem like a very promising filmmaker. And when it comes to us, like I appreciate that he, you know, he wrote it himself and directed it. And you know, it, it's a nicely shot film. It looks really good. Um, but for me, the biggest problem is, you know, with good cinematography, good score, good jokes, all that stuff aside. If I if I can't get into the storyline of the movie. That stuff's not going to matter. I need a good story to the movie. And I just, this was just too big of a leap. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't accept the, the storyline. And if you've seen at least the trailers and know the basic premise, it's uh, Nupita Luongo and her family, they're off in a house, kind of in a, the woods or something. And then an evil version of the family shows up outside. So an evil Nupita Luongo and an evil version of her husband and an evil version of her two young kids, the son and daughter. And so that's the, the basic premise. That's what you get from the trailer. And the thing about it is I've been talking a lot about it this week to my friends. That And my problem is they should have just left it a mystery of where these people came from. If you had just told me that there's an evil version of this family outside and they're trying to come in and kill them, I don't know where they came from. Must be some sort of black magic or something supernatural. I would accept that, and it probably could have made for a good movie. Um, talking to my brother about it yesterday, I was saying how, you know, like, I can enjoy Friday the 13th movie, even if it's kind of silly and unrealistic, and, you know, I know Jason comes back from the dead every every time, and why does that happen? I don't know. You know, he just crawls out of the ground or comes out of the lake, and Jason's back. And I accept that, and that's fine. But in this movie, I found they over-explained it. They tried to, they wanted to tell you, where these evil versions of this family came from. And they told you a little bit, and they told you a little bit more. And as I was hearing it, I was like, this is ridiculous. This this doesn't make any sense. How would this work in this real world? Like, they were trying to explain it as if this was a possible real phenomenon. And I just couldn't get past that part of the story. Um, I also compared it a little bit to uh, midichlorians when I was telling my brother about the movie yesterday. Um, you know, when we watched the original Star Wars movie and they said there's the force, you know, there's the dark side and the light side and, you know, everybody just bought into that. That's fine. There's the force. I don't know. What is it? It's a mythical power. You can move stuff through the sky and uh, I don't know, whatever. It's the force. But then when they got to the prequels and they tried to over explain it, oh, there's midichlorian count in your blood and that's uh, like it just kind of ruined the mystique and left you scratching your head and like, well, really? OK, so only people with midichlorians can are force sensitive. You know, I didn't like it. And with us, they over-explained it, and then it made me think about how this would work, which pulled me out of the movie, and I couldn't, the more I thought about it, the less sense it seemed to make. So, yeah, if you can accept the kind of silly premise, um, then yeah, I think it probably, it is a good movie, but I couldn't get past the silly premise, so, you know, I, I don't know. Now, in its defense, it was something that I... Have been talking about for days. I've had a pretty, a couple of pretty lengthy conversations about the movie actually, and not every movie you know prompts that out of me. You know, sometimes you talk about a movie for a couple of minutes after you watch it. Sometimes you're like, yeah, that was good, and you forget about it. This one did resonate. I have been talking about it, but I don't know if I'm talking about it for the reasons that uh, you know Peel would want me to be talking about it. It's I, I just found it the suspension of disbelief required was too much. So, uh, yeah, I think that's all I really have for movies. I don't even think I've watched anything on Netflix this re this week. I, uh, I re-watched Season 9 of Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is always great. So if you haven't watched Curb Enthusiasm, check it out. Okay, so let's go to our next uh, regular segment. And where this is where we talk about comic books. Comic booking. All right, so this is comic booking. And I'll tell you a little bit about the comic books I bought uh, this week. So I'm going to grab those. Now, I haven't read through all of these yet, um, but I got Superior Spider-Man number four. Uh, I've been enjoying Superior Spider-Man. Um, yeah, all four issues thus far have been uh, enjoyable, so I would recommend Superior Spider-Man. New issue of Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, I haven't really been enjoying this current storyline called Hunted. You know, I like the, the artwork. Uh, it's Humberto Ramos that's drawing it. You know, this is his artwork on the cover. Uh, so I always recommend Humberto Ramos's art. Uh, I just, I'm not really digging Nick Spencer's storyline. I haven't really been digging anything Nick Spencer's done on Amazing yet. 
Um, but I'm hoping eventually it pans out. So anyway, I gotta keep buying it anyway, but you know, it doesn't get my glowing recommendation. Uh, this one's been out a while, um, but when it first came out, my comic shop didn't get one. So I had asked them to order it in for me, and it took a while to get here. I actually ended up getting the Sleepwalker miniseries before Darkhawk. So now if you're totally in the dark about what this is, there's a, a big storyline that was going on a little while ago uh, called Infinity uh, Infinity War, maybe. Um, and so this is part of the, the countdown to Infinity. So this was kind of like a prequel to that main storyline. And there was a couple little mini-series that tied into it. So this was four issues of Darkhawk, which is kind of a forgotten 90s character. And I really liked Darkhawk. I collected the run back in the 90s. And similarly, I collected Sleepwalker in the 90s, which came out right around the same time. It kind of had the same vibe. And so I read Sleepwalker, and I think it was clearly supposed to have taken place after this, because I think it tied into some things that happened in this storyline. And if you watched my prior video, I didn't love that Sleepwalker miniseries. I don't know if it's because it was tied into a bigger event, which I didn't read, but I just found it kind of confusing. And even though it had some nice artwork, uh, I just really couldn't recommend it, unless you were like a hardcore Sleepwalker fan. I haven't read this one yet, so I'm going to guess it's maybe more of the same. Unless you're a hardcore Darkhawk fan, you probably don't need to read this either. You can probably enjoy the, the main Infinity storyline without reading this. But uh, I don't know. If, you, if you're wondering how it panned out, ask me in the comments, because I'll probably have it read in the next day or two. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping it's good. All right, so next up is Cloak and Dagger. And uh, I'm a big Cloak and Dagger fan from way back in the day. Um... I've bought all their series over the years. They never seem to last very long. This uh, was a mini series that I guess was originally published online, which is kind of different. I don't think that's something that is common from Marvel. But yeah, this storyline was uh, available digitally first, and now this is its uh, first time in print. So uh, haven't read it yet. Can't really comment if it's good or bad or not, but uh, I'm excited to see Cloak and Dagger back. Uh, Mr. Negative is a fun villain. So yeah, hopefully this makes for a good story. All right. And the uh, the last book I bought this week was, uh, this is another one that's been out for a little while, um, but my my local comic shop didn't get any copies in. I guess there's not a whole lot of demand. So when they didn't end up getting it in, I had to ask them to order it in special for me, and it took a while to get here. So yeah, this is The Crow, Memento Mori. And uh, so yeah, this is just a collection of a four-shoe Crow miniseries that was out uh, earlier this year, maybe last year um and this is always a gamble with uh the crow um if you're familiar with the property at all you're probably more familiar with it from the uh the movies and the the original crow movie is my all-time favorite movie I, I i've seen it dozens of times and i love it and even maybe certain things haven't aged well or certain effects or you know, some people comment on how the storyline's maybe a little jagged here because of the tragedy that occurred during the making of the film that uh, required some editing to be made around the storyline or whatever. Anyway, I don't care about any of that stuff. I, I love the movie from start to finish. And I had never read a Crow comic book before the movie had come out because um, the original Crow comic book that the movie was based on was kind of a, an indie thing it wasn't published by marvel or dc and i was still a, kind of a kid then and i didn't really know much about indie comics at all um but the crow is the thing that kind of turned me on to them a little bit and i started looking at more uh different stories published by companies like uh dark horse and whatnot so um yeah this is the original crow um not the original printing um but yeah I, I've i gone back and, and read this after I'd seen the movie already a bunch of times. And I know most people would say that, you know, the movies never live up to the book. And who knows, if I had read this first and saw the movie, maybe I would say that too because they're radically different. If I really wanted an, ad, an adaptation of this, the movie doesn't really deliver this. But the thing is, I'd already fallen in love with the movie before I read this, so... This didn't really live up to the movie for me. Uh, I still enjoy this, but uh, I, I absolutely love that first movie. And I love it so much that I pretty much bought everything Crow-related since. Um, you know, there's been 
a number of sequels. I don't know if you're aware, but there was Crow 2, City of Angels. That was pretty well received. It had a theatrical run. But then the Crow 3 and Crow 4, you know, they came out and they were just direct-to-video releases. Uh, there was the TV series um, that had come out. Um, multiple comic books. Um, not all of them great. You know, here's some of my, my Crow books. Um, some of them really stand out as uh, like this one here, which was actually written by James O'Barr, the guy that wrote the original Crow. And this was a, a Crow set and like a Nazi con concentration camp. That was a pretty cool storyline. Um, this one here, there's a little kid that was the Crow. This one here called the Crow Pestilence. I really liked this one. It was kind of a, you know, very straightforward Crow revenge movie. Or revenge story is what you'd expect from these things. But I remember really cool artwork and stuff in here. Anyway, I liked it a lot. But uh, they are a little bit of hit and miss. And nothing Crow related. Any of the movies, the TV show, any of the comic books have ever lived up to the first Crow movie for me. So some of them have been straight up disappointing. And so when I got this, I was like, uh, I hope it's good. I don't really expect it to be all that good. And I, I just finished reading it before coming down here to film this video. And uh, I liked it a lot, actually. I was kind of surprised. Um, like, the artwork is nice throughout. Um, find some cool, cool shots here for you. I don't know, but... Yeah, so check that out. So, yeah, this crow is an altar boy. And he was uh, run over by a truck by terrorists in Rome. And so this st story uh, is about him going after the terrorists. And again, it seemed like a pretty straightforward crow story. And after reading the first uh, one or two issues, I was enjoying it. But uh, I was quickly realizing that, again, this is never going to live up to the original crow. Because what I liked so much about that first movie is how even though the bad guys are quickly dispatched... You each one is kind of developed just enough that you really you kind of like them. Like Tintin is the first bad guy that gets killed in the movie, and I, I love the character of Tintin, even though he doesn't do a whole lot. They just established him and gave him some personality. Um, same with all the guys. And this one here, he starts killing the bad guys. I don't know their names. I don't know anything about them, and I don't really care. So I kind of thought, yeah, this is one of those ones where you you know it's just going to be kind of a generic revenge story. But there is a bit of a twist that comes along. And I thought that really kind of elevated this. So yeah, if you're even remotely a Crow fan, or even if you weren't beforehand, I would maybe recommend you track down the Crow Memento Mori. And, uh, and yeah, that's it for comic books. And so I guess that's it for this video. So thanks for watching. And uh, yeah, I'll see you on the next episode. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and leave me comments. I appreciate it. So thanks again.